workshop number one. This is the first version of workshop number one. It will be held again tomorrow. Um, but I'd like to go ahead and welcome uh, Dr. Lana Whiskeyjack and Kyle Napier. And their workshop is called Reconnecting to the Spirit of the Language. Uh, tense, uh, tense Kewell, um, thank you for, for welcoming us into, um, yeah, into your, your time and, 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 uh, and considering, um, and considering our work, your, your role as a linguist and, uh, and the, and the concept and the context and the relationality of, of spirit as it relates to language. Um, so I'm here with, uh, Dr. Lana Whiskeyjack, and, uh, I just wanted to say, um, first of all, aloha and, uh, and I wanted to recognize the lands that the University of Hawaii is situated on. I also wanted to recognize um, the servers, uh, whether in California or otherwise internationally that are hosting um, and, and the indigenous lands that those servers are situated on um, that allow us to have these conversations and, and further the, uh, the indigenous lands that remind um, for us to, to use the, the te digital technologies uh, that we're communicating on right now. And uh, just ensuring that that we really recognize the role of, of land in, in spirit and in language and, and contemporary digital connectivity. Um, and uh, just a little bit about our, our, our presentation um, before I, I maybe, maybe Lana, uh, would you mind uh, kind of going through our presentation? Is that okay? I think I, I spoke ahead of time there at the intro. Yes, Tansik Akianawagamaganak, hello my relation. Um, today we're going to be talking about, um, well, introducing who we are as uh, researchers and uh, servers of this beautiful research project. Um, and we're going to have discussion around the spirit of the language, introducing our research work and uh, going into some of the disconnections. And so these will be uh, we'll have little breakout rooms so we can have short little discussions around these different uh, themes and then uh, closing with reconnecting to the spirit of the language and how we are going to move forward. Thank you. So with that, I'll introduce myself and Danse Kakiao Nito Demtek Lana Whiskey Jack Nitsigason Onexkopone Kotsinia Egua and the assistant professor in the Faculty of Arts and Women's and Gender Studies at the University of Alberta. I am from Sad Lake Cree Nation. I'm a Nehio as well, a Cree woman. And uh, I always love to introduce myself in my language because the root words of both my name is uh, for a short kind of English translation. Um, and I am from, which are important ways of introducing ourselves as, as Isinuak, beings of this land, is that it is the Utsi, um, Nitsi connection. So when I'm introducing myself in my language, I'm actually telling you who my belly buttons are connected to, which of course reflects that, you know, Nehioak were matrilineal people who identified and honor our women's connections. Uh, and with that, I'd like to also, uh, acknowledge the generations I come from uh, with my great great grandmother Kototo, um, her daughter Maggie and Maggie's daughter Caroline, my grandmother, and then my Nigawi and of course me, Nia, Lana, um, my daughter Serena and uh, my granddaughter Amu. And in our my auntie would always say, you know you've lived a good long life when you were able to meet your great grand parent um, and live long enough to meet your great grandchild. So hopefully I'll live long enough to, to do that. And with that, that's kind of like that connection, seven generations connections. I'm a graduate from the University of Nehalia Theats Nistame Maganak Blue Quills, which was a former Indian residential school where two generations of the wombs that I come from attended. And so I'm also an artist um, or as a scholarist. So I'm an arts-based practice researcher uh, and educator. And thank you for being here. So let me be here today. Hi, hi. And Kyle Napier Netsikatsan Maga Sazi Kal Napier Sulye. I'm connected to both Dene Dedlane Ati and Sagao Nehiawin, both of which are uh, 
endangered indigenous languages, um, which are facing uh, problems around recognition. Dana Dedlene Ati, I had the um, privilege of being able to share at this conference with my elder Aline Beaver, as well as um, uh, I'm con- Lana and I have been connected in language work for at least half a decade now, and, and ancestrally for thousands of years, I'm sure. Um, and so I'm just excited to, to bring my role in the convergence of, of digital of a, as a digital technologist and a communicator and a media maker um, into uh, the world of Indigenous language reclamation, particularly with the language design connected to. Um, from Tabacha in Denende, and colonially that's referred to as Fort Smith, Northwest Territories, in uh, again colonial Canada. Um, so, what is is Nehiawawin? At least when when we're here talking about our own language, um, which is Nehiawawin, it, it's it's what it means is like Nehio, we're people of four parts of the soil. That's the root in the in the in the um, the morphophonemic understanding of of Nehio. That's a polysynthetic language. It's not gendered in the way that um, you know many of uh, many global languages are. Um, the how it's colonially referred to as Cree, which is actually not uh, a, a Nehio word. It's not Nehio when Nehio when word. It's a it's a, a colonial um, kind of con- conjunction of, of words. And um, there used to be six hundred thousand words in our language that were awoke. Um, but now there are there are roughly fifteen thousand that are awake, uh, according to Ruben Quinn, a, a really renowned uh, Nehio scholar and and linguist. Um, so. You know, there is a decline in language speakers, but as a lot of people recognize, there's a, there's an, there's a, an increase in the number of, of those who are learning uh, the language as a second, uh, a second learner, um, particularly those who are ancestrally connected. So um, in our own work of, of recognizing the spirit of the language, we knew that we had to hold ourselves accountable to communities. Um, and so in the same way that this conference recognizes uh, community uh, oriented and, and focused and prioritized protocol, um, we also uh, prioritized uh, the work of and words of those who were sharing their knowledge and words. Um, even right before we joined our conference today, we uh, we, we smudged and held ourselves in, in ceremony, Lana and I, partly because of nerves, but also because of, of spirit and, and reconnecting too. Um, and uh, and so in this in 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 the process, we we held um, Lana Lana held many kind of one-on-one um, recordings, which were like in individual interviews and, and recordings and, uh, and, and a few different um, sharing circles and dialogue circles where people were invited to join and, and share their um, understanding and context around spirit uh, disconnects to the spirit of the language and reconnects to the spirit of the language. Um, following that, we uh, ensured that those who did share their words were able to hear and, and read how we're using their words in the nature of this project. So actually this this, uh, presentation isn't really based necessarily on the words of of those who shared um, their their words for our work then, but mostly around the the process and coming to understanding of the themes that we found emergent. Um, So we borrowed heavily from the words of indigenous scholars um, particularly uh, Dr. Margaret Kovach and Dr. Leona Makokas, themselves both Nehio scholars. Um, around understanding um, both in, can, insider outsider uh, research, Dr. Margaret Kovach is really good at that because we are both insider outsiders in this. We're insiders as both Nehiwak and um, and outsiders as 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 you know bringing bringing an academic uh, kind of uh, paradigm and process into into uh, those communities. You know we're, we're still tied to ac- ac- uh, the academy. And then um, I really particularly am drawn to the work of of Dr. Jennifer Wemaguan, who reminds us to work with digitized indigenous knowledges uh, to treat them as ancestral as uh, ancestral bundles, as digital bundles in the same way that you would treat a medicine bundle. Um, and so once a recording is, is digitized, uh, to treat it in the same respect that you would um, a medicine. So a lot of really good reminders there. Um, I'll just quickly introduce the slide and then um, Lana will talk more about what the spirit of, of language means and then we'll invite you into, into groups. So this is just a photo of, uh, of Matilda Lewis, who is uh, the mother of Dr. Kevin Lewis, who runs uh, Kanyasa Culture Camps uh, and a university accredited land-based Neho Women Immersion Camp. It's amazing, <laughs> unbiasedly, totally biasedly, it's amazing. Um, so anyway, what in, in her hands is holding this small birch bark canoe and um, 
actually at this camp, they made uh, a much larger actual out of birch uh, bark canoe. And I had taken this photo and um, in order to share this photo, I actually uh, uh, recognized and got permission and gave copyright to Matilda, who, you know, that defies, you know, uh, typical copyright law, but also, um, that being, you know, the, 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 accred the language camp that we're working with, they're constantly looking for funding. So um, the funds that we received from both ICLDC and um, an award that we received for this photo, um, any funds that we've received through this project, we funneled through Kaniastic Culture Camps. So just ensuring that the community receives um, the benefits that we do as, as scholars. And then Lana, do you mind uh, walking through the spirit section? Yes, thank you. Um, so, uh, was there another slide for that? Or um, part of the intention with the this work was uh, I'm a language learner. I, I grew up with uh, Nehio way speak Nehio way when speakers, and um, but it wasn't passed down to me. So part of this work is is reclaiming that language for my own self. Um, as well as connecting, not only connecting to communities, building those relations, but also to strengthen, which is a really important part when we're doing this kind of research work. So we uh, went to visit communities that um, I had prior, we had prior relationships with and hosted sharing circles. And so one of some of the themes, of course, that emerged from just talking about the spirit of the language was the importance of it coming from the land, that it's land based and that uh, one of my elders would often say language is spirit and our words are medicine. So that's kind of been the basis of um, of, of the guiding, uh, you know, guiding wisdom of our elders of, of moving this work forward. And the importance, of course, of the kinship, the wakotawin, um, and those laws of uh, that guide are having good relations with one another, and based on natural laws, which are laws from the land that teach us about kindness, sharing, truth, and courage. And so, um, yeah, there's, it's been an incredible um, journey to be able to work with our communities and language uh, warriors, in a sense, to continue to move this work forward. And so uh, we're gonna break out into our first uh, discussion uh, group, group discussions. And so I just wanted to invite um, those in indigenous language speakers or those who are learning their indigenous language to, uh, we'll go into three groups and under group one, we're gonna speak specifically about the language and the spirit of the language. And of course, specifically of the land and group two, talk about the language to the, in relation to the land. And in group three, talk about laws. What are some of the laws that you're learning about from your languages? And so kind of some of the protocols we wanted to place in these group discussions is that um, to make it specifically um, to the indigenous language. So those who are, are not, um, it, it, land-based Indigenous language speakers to have hold as a space of listening, of active listening. And when we come back, if you could also uh, nominate someone to speak and give a, a very short um, kind of closing uh, brief summary of your discussions. Anything else, Kyle? <laughs> That's right. So there are three groups in the breakout rooms. So if you go down on Zoom to that little ellipses, that little dot, 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 if you click on that, there's three different breakout rooms. So yeah, the first one will be group run, one, where you'll talk about language as it relates to the spirit of the language. Um, land, as it relates to the spirit of the language is group two. And then group three is laws, as it relates to the spirit of the language. And then um, we'll reconvene in about, in about 10 minutes. So um, feel free to talk uh, candidly amongst yourselves. We, uh, won't, we won't jump into your call. We'd like for you to kind of have that organic space as it, as it emerges. And again, if you're, if you're not in an, um, if you're not uh, ancestrally connected to um, the Indigenous language that you're working with, to try to hold a, a space of listening. And uh, we'll see you in, in 10 minutes. Okay, so just as a reminder um, that those little ellipses are, are down if, and on Zoom. If you click the little dot, 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 it should say choose breakout room. Okay, so you click the dot, 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 choose breakout room. And then there's three, um, three different breakout rooms. 
And if we start noticing that there's actually quite a number of people here uh, still in the room, uh, we might randomly assign people. Okay. Sorry, just having a little trouble getting into the room. Oh, for sure, yeah. Um, so uh, what, what platform are you using? Are you on an iPad or a computer? Yeah, I'm on a MacBook Air. A MacBook Air? Okay, so just, uh, um, yeah, I know Zoom's a bit, a bit tricky. Um, so when you move a mouse around, uh, do you see a little bar at the bottom? Uh, I, well, I see the breakout rooms, but it won't let me enter. Okay, so when you see, um, so you see room one, room two, room three, yeah. if you hover your mouse above it, um, right next to it, uh, on the right, it'll say a number. And if you hover your mouse above that, it'll say join. Oh, and it's then, not I also have the capability to add you to a room. Okay. If you just okay. let me know and I can send you there. Um, that goes for anyone who's having trouble. Okay, I was looking at room one. Okay, I'll send you there right now. Thank you. I'm having trouble too. Can you send me to room three? Yes. Uh, I'm having trouble too. Um, room two, group two. I'm having trouble too. Mm -hmm. Root, uh, group one. One. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for being so helpful there. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. We had the issue um, at the last one, so. This is Justin. Um, I clicked out. I did not see the three dice or I don't see any breakout room uh, oh. options available. So could you send me to group uh, two, please? Mm -hmm. uh, Justin. J-U-S-T-O-N. Okay. <laughs> right, I'll send you over now. Thank you. We've got one in the chat. There's one in the chat. Yeah. Asking to go to room one. Now, is it like total anarchy in the rooms? We don't know, hey? <laughs> <laughs> That's going. So go join. It looks like three only has four people and the other ones are pretty full. Very interesting. Okay, so that, that's a good note for Lana and I to, to maybe, um, because we're actually at double the time that we intended for us to be at now. So meaning like you, we uh, will have to speak briefly on this next upcoming slides. Um, is that uh, maybe we'll we'll let the groups talk, and if they cover most about language or, or stuff, maybe we'll we'll emphasize that our time spent on laws instead of language and land. Okay, there you go. Good idea. If that works for you, Lana. And then we broke out the groups at I think twelve fifty seven. And so, uh, I mean, some people just joined, but like two two three minutes, I guess. Is that, I don't know. How. Yeah, I think you have the option to call people back, like close the rooms and call people back automatically at a certain time. Nice. Yeah, I have that option. And actually, since no one's coming into the waiting room, if you'd like me to send that power back to you, I can do that. Oh, right, right, okay. Um, yeah. I don't mind keeping it yeah. if you prefer that too. So whatever works. Uh, yeah, yeah. If you don't mind, um, maybe setting a one-minute warning right now. Actually, okay, would be good. Just because we're running, we're running a little bit behind here. I like that people are changing their names too. They're putting the parentheses here to listen on their names. That's whoa, cool. La whoa, yeah. holy! We're seeing <laughs> seeds of mobilization. <laughs> Would you like me to close the rooms? It'll take a minute for them to come back. Uh, yeah, when, when the minute is up, that'll be good. Okay.
And then Lana, is it all right with you if if I um, when people come back, I'll I'll, I'll just invite them to um, do the uh, uh, nominate and do like a quick one minute thing. Um, does, yeah. Oh, yeah. Boy. And then the rest of the section will be yours. All right, we're starting to see a number of people come back and uh, I think that signifies the end of, of the breakout room. So um, hopefully it wasn't total anarchy in the rooms. Um, at least the laws group, it seemed like, had the least amount of people. So uh, <laughs> coincidentally, like, so I'm, I'm quite curious here. Um, maybe the, the person who was uh, uh, from group one who might be able to very quickly um, maybe do a, a one minute uh, kind of highlights from, from your section, if that's okay. I'll, I'll do the uh, breakout room recording. We just sort of sat there for a while, didn't know if someone was coming from the main group, one of the, one of the instructors, and then we're like, oh yeah, I guess nobody's really coming. Um, so I was the only one who shared what I, what I thought of what this was. And so that's really the only piece that I have to report on is, is my own sharing. And what I shared was that, um, you know, when we're learning language, when, and especially just recently teaching adults in a volunteer capacity uh, online, one of the things that, that we're doing or that I am doing incorporating into the language learning is to learn how to ground yourself. So, you know, to calm the butterflies or the, the knots that are in your stomach because you're speaking the language or practicing the language and that's part of the spirit of the language. So we always have a, uh, we have prayer, we have song, but we also get the students to do some really serious deep breathing and to breathe through that fear of, of speaking. And then I also get them to shut their video off um, so that they're not distracted by somebody's earring on a really nice screen or background or, you know, different things going on. So just to, you know, to minimize the number of distractions, you know, you're, you're really focusing on, on what's coming through these things, like what's coming through your ears. And so that's what I, that's what we practice with them. And that's, that's all we got to share in our group because we came back in right away. Amazing. Thank you so much. And, uh, and I really appreciate that. And that is just a, a really great reminder about, you know, the, um, the, the power of language as it does as it does connect to the spirit and we're going to talk about some examples of what we learned um, as well uh, could someone from uh, group two uh, talking about land as it as it connects to the spirit of the language maybe a very very brief um, kind of highlights if that's okay I want to respect your words but also our time here Why, I'll jump in. Um, we had time for two people to speak and the things that came up were the idea of stewardship. Um, and then also the idea of land is something that we've lost a, 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 as well as our language and also changing the way that we think of land. Um, land as commodity rather than as an ancestor, as our ancestor. That's great. And, and we're gonna talk about um... Wow, yeah, land as ancestor, that, that's huge and, and something that, uh, wow, that really resonates. Um, and, and we're gonna talk about the commodification and the role of capitalism as a, uh, as a, play in, as a player in the role of disconnecting from the spirit of the language um, as an external force. And then could someone from group three um, very quickly talk about uh, the role of laws, whether it's indigenous laws or, or however you interpreted that as it relates to the spirit of the language. Um, I'm Gwini Osta from Grand River Country. This is Haudenosaunee, uh, Iroquois Confederacy lands here, Southern Ontario, upstate New York. And where connection, well, I jumped into Lodge because I figure hardly anybody would be there. And I wanted to hear what everybody had to say, just because, you know, we're talking about spirit of the language and then we're talking about law. I come from a people where we had 
a prophet peacemaker with the great law. And that's what um, I had mentioned some of the uh, people that were around when the 13 colonies existed borrowed from our laws. And our laws were intent intended for um, anybody that wanted to seek shelter under the tree of peace would come and join our under you know, sit in the shade with us and enjoy the bounty and the peacefulness of everything. That law is huge and you can find it anywhere. We're one of the most documented people throughout North America, the Iroquois people. I'm Mohawk Nation myself and or there's the law, the spirit law, right? You don't enter the bush without acknowledging to those spirits that you're entering and what your intentions are. Like if right now it's time for the maple trees to start running, right? So we we gather together as a community and we give um, our acknowledgement to the trees and let them know because crazy things could happen to you when you're out there, right? So we kind of forewarned them that we're coming out to collect the sap, you know, and that this is our um, our gift to them, you know. We give our uh, our traditional tobacco to them, and and we give that acknowledgement and that respect to that space. So, I mean that. I mean, that, that doesn't only happen at um, the time of the maple sap, but whenever we go pick medicine, right? Whenever we go uh, do, if we're going to do some fasting or some purging or anything like that, right? We always acknowledge the medicines and we always acknowledge whatever it is that um, we're connected to interconnectedness with the universe. Thank you so much. That's that's a really powerful way to talk about laws as it relates to, to, to the spirit of language. Thank you. Um, and then, Len, um, Lana, I'm gonna um, uh, invite myself to take a step back here and <laughs> for you to talk about um, what you've learned from this. Hi, hi. So thank you everyone who shared and uh, it, it's, it was very difficult to um, try balance and navigate the time scheduling. Um, so we'd have a little bit of time to share and, uh, and time to uh, listen and learn. Um, but we're grateful for your patience as we work through, rush through this. Um, but also um, thank you for sharing. Thank you. So, in the work we've been doing around the spirit of the language, definitely, as mentioned already, the, um, the importance of the, the language to the land and the language as this, uh, uh, our worldview embedded in this, in this morpho syntax language. Uh, an example of, of that would be woman, which in Cree is a swell, and uh, fire is gotel, coming from women. So there's this whole worldview and everything is tied to our creation stories where we learned, where we learned um, how to be humans of this land. And Cree is, is based on animate and inanimate, meaning that when we speak, we speak of our beings as being a living, growing being or versus none. So a tree is a living being, but um, a chair is not. So there's, that's how we distinguish. And, and we always are speaking in relation to one another, right? So the example with Andrea Custer, who we interviewed, talked about Kisa I love you, you are loved by me, you know, which is different than how we say it in, in English. And as mentioned before that, our language is considered as spirit. When we are speaking it, we're animating it, we're bringing it to life in order to connect to one another. And that's importance of passing it on to the next generation. Uh, so when we're, you know, when we're talking about language, um, how we don't have a lot of the same uh, sounds as it is in English. Uh, we don't have B, D, F, G, uh, as Ruben Quinn shared. And when we pass, you know, when we're talking about our ancestors, we talk about them and how they brought the spirit into the world. And one of the best practices in kind of learning the language has been through our syllabic. So learning, um, you know, the visual, we're very visual people and the syllabics being um, our spirit markers. 
And uh, it's one of the ways I'm, I'm fluent in reading and writing syllabics, but I'm still learning about what I'm, when I'm listening to someone speak Cree, I can do the syllabics um, because of the sounds, the importance of that visually seeing the sounds. Um, thank you. And then of course we go into um, our land-based, how our language comes from the land and the importance of when we're engaging with the language, it's, it's, um, it's connected to uh, the, you know, as, as mentioned about with the laws, the importance of like a, that connection to our medicines, to those beings of the land. And so land-based education is from what we've heard from our, um, from those we interviewed is the best practice. Like in order to connect to the language, you have to connect to the land. And so, and that we're constantly, when you're learning in that connection to learn and love, because that's the, what I, as um, Sky mentioned earlier, as the land, as our ancestor is constantly sharing that love. Uh, and, and, you know, when we're speaking about love too, like the importance looking at the language of how everything, everything is interconnected. interconnected. So, so when, when we're really, like, for example, when you're looking at um, the word for strawberries is um, it's a heart berry. And, and one of the ways in learning about, you know, the medicines of the land, um, it, often in the language, it tells you what those medicines are for. So strawberries, it looks like a heart, um, is, is our heart berry. It's a medicine actually for our heart as well. And so it's really important that we have those, uh, those connections, uh, teachings and learning about those medicines through uh, connecting to the land. Uh, when we come to the laws, uh, every like all, our laws come from the land. We learn the laws from the land, and like the trees teach us about about honesty. The, our grandfather mountains teach us about courage. Our you know from our buffalo to our moose, they teach us about sharing. And as you know, we've heard earlier from Gwenny about you know the law um, tree of peace. And the spirit laws, those that it comes across all over what we call mystic, um, also known as as uh, Turtle Island. Um, of that, there are so many of those teachings within the language that we we have become disconnected with. But those teachings have always been there, as each of those exist. Those relatives have existed from trees to rocks. Uh, and of course, the importance of learning those laws within our ceremonies. And so as mentioned in the first from the first group, the importance of how we need to um, connect to that spirit of the land through our ceremonies and through the language that we use. So, um, you know, when we when we are when we're in our our prayers, when we're in our pipe ceremonies or sweat lodge or the ceremonies that each of our different diverse uh, language land groups have, and so those are ways of, of learning how to be a better human being, of, of seeing from that worldview. And one of my um, aunties, uh, who was part of our research work, uh, talked about that. You have to use ceremony, and to me that is spirit. Like, it's part of that getting grounded, getting connected to the land, to those elements, the rocks, the trees that are so important to our ceremonies, that we have to begin there, was, was constantly being repeated throughout our, our work. Thank you, Lana. Um, now, this next theme subhead, uh, where we were talking about the spirit of the language, well, now we would have to talk about the disconnects from the spirit of the language, um, whether historical or ongoing. So I just want to preface this part of the discussion by saying that it does include sensitive subject matter, um, particularly around residential schooling, genocide, diaspora, and ideological imperialism. Um, the intention of this uh, part of the discussion is to recognize institutional harms while ensuring that there is room for, uh, for dual belief systems. Uh, there had been a group, um, a group 
uh, option for people to join groups to discuss to discuss uh, disconnects. But I think um, in interest of time that I might just talk about what we've learned in our research, and then we can spend more time talking about um, reconnecting to the spirit of the language. So if you don't mind. Um, so here are just some things that we've learned um, throughout, the, throughout the discussion from people present, uh, sharing their words with us. Um, we're, we're, you know, having identified the, the, what is the spirit of the language that disconnects became emergent through, you know, impacts, of course, of, re of residential schooling, um, through starvation, sickness, disease, um, through the role of, uh, of, ca of capitalism, particularly um, in westward expansion, through train lines, um, the role of genocide, not only in removing people from their, their families and their lands, but also um, killing um, all of the animals that were relied on, both in relation and subsistence. So you hear all of these things and you research all of these things, and we decided to organize them into three different subject heads. And, uh, you know, what, where we would have invited you into um, groups to discuss the role of um, uh, uh, Christianity as an institution, not necessarily a belief system, but an institution, um, the role of colonization and, and all, uh, all of those together uh, with, with capitalism. So um, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll just share actually a bit of, of what we've learned. So uh, the role of Christianity in affecting the spirit of Indigenous language revitalization actually begins, begins before contact. Um, and that's with uh, papal bull decrees and authorization um, from popes who, who would say that, uh, you know, those who were not uh, believers of, of, of Christianity weren't people and therefore were up, um, you know, you could sell uh, non non Christians and and all of this, enslave them, and so um, that 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 was the immediate effect uh, that kind of prefaced um, even even you know Columbus's uh, nearing of the continent. He never actually touched touched base. Um, so you know we we see examples. A lot of linguists are familiar with the Wampanoag language that that Noam Chomsky uh, worked to uh, in collaboration with. Well. Um, that was actually the first Bible published on this continent was in the Wampanoag language. You can imagine why it's, it's, it's for conversion. So the first Bible published was not in English, French, or Spanish on this continent. It was, uh, it was in what's in colonially referred to as New England and uh, in, in Wampanoag. Um, so then you see, of course, residential schooling. So the example on the top is, uh, is an example of uh, Edmonton Residential School, which was... Um, uh, the building itself became subject to arson and uh, the residential school we see, um, what had been a residential school at the bottom is actually um, where Dr. Lana Whiskeyjack uh, graduated with her doctorates. There was a sit-in in 1970 on, uh, on Blue Quill's residential school, which then became University Blue Quill's, the first First Nations owned university in Canada. So, well, you know, maybe I'm not talking about as much the role in, in its disconnect, um, but perhaps that's some inspiration around the, the reconnect uh, seed. <laughs> now, around colonization, um, again, that had been authorized uh, ahead by papal decree. Um, colonization would be the major impetus of war, starvation, and disease. So the more people you have coming in, again, with westward expansion, um, the more you have, you have the role of, uh, of, 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 of diseases that which were not, which were not otherwise available um, <laughs> here. So, uh, you know, with this, we see the participation and 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 almost and, and almost a forced involvement of indigenous people in uh, larger international wars, um, particularly with with language. Um, you know, you you see recognition of, you know, the the those who were who were um, speakers of the language being able to code talkers. They were referred to. So you see the abuses of indigenous languages not simultaneous to their supports or recognition at the same time. Resident uh, that that um, indigenous languages were abused for war. Um, residential schools existed and people were beaten it for speaking at, at, at home. Um, so, uh, you know, with, with colonization and with Rupert's land, we see these are all the, of the treaties, at least in our, our uh, situation in Canada, uh, colonial Canada, uh, previously the Dominion of Canada, previous to that Rupert's land, as it was assumed to be owned by Hudson Bay Company. Well, um, Rupert's land in its assumed ownership of the land through corporatization of the land, um, then sold the land to Canada um, pre-treaty, and then right Canada recognized uh, the 
the queen recognized the need for legitimacy through treaty making. Um, and so it's that need for legitimacy of treaty making um, which begetted uh, the signing. Um, and it's these treaties uh, which would be abused and, and um, essentially lies on paper that um, might be a good way to describe them. Um, uh, and then again, with, with, with capitalism, um, we see that the role of co colonies having to be practical, so profitable, right? The capitalism didn't emerge uh, in, in the 1600s. Prior to that, it was mercantilism when these new colonies had to pay back to, um, to the queen, right, to the, to the crown. Um, and so they had a need to be profitable. Well, with that comes um, uh, industrial revolutions. So we see the first industrial revolution, the steam engine. Um, we see the second industrial revolution, the need for, um, for, for gasoline. And with, now with, with each of these, think about what's happening, right? So, uh, so with the need for, for gasoline, 1876, uh, you see more of a search for gas and oil up in, again, in Northern territories where, where Lana and I from. A lot of people know where Fort Mac is. I'm downstream from Fort Mac. Um, literally, there are families that I'm related to that cannot drink their water because of um, the need for gasoline globally. So um, then we see the third industrial revolution, which emerges in the, in the 1960s, uh, which is the microprocessor, the reason we're using a computer today. Um, and then the fourth industrial revolution, uh, colloquially industrial revolution 4.0, which is digital connectivity. Now with digital connectivity brings anglophonic bias and a need, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're at all a coder or work with, you know, digital languages, you see that it's a predominantly in a, in a bully language, right? You can code in, in English, you can't code in Nehyabawin. Um, you would need to create um, uh, a proprietary uh, kind of language or whatever in your language to be able to do that. So with the ubiquity of Industrial Revolution 4.0, you see um, how much that's affecting. Uh, the, you need to be able to, to, to speak um, a major language to participate online. Barring, uh, you know, what we're, what we're seeing now is the, the emergence of community networks, which can be um, done and created uh, for people in their own languages, and you don't need an internet connectivity for that. So we're, we're seeing solutions like that lately. Um, and uh, yeah, so so thank you for, for for hearing me talk a bit about that instead of um, inviting a larger dis discussion. So thank you for your patience. But that does allow us more time to talk about um, the reconnects to the spirit of the language. So uh, Lana, if you don't mind uh, moving this ahead. That way, thank you. Uh, just to let people know, when when Kyle was working through that tedious uh, lit review of looking at all the laws and policies, in specifically in Canada, but we did look at also, of course, the international laws that affect our treaties, um, was reminding Kyle to constantly smudge through this because this was really heavy work of looking at. Oh my goodness, the amount of laws and policies our government did to oppress and disconnect us from our lands has, yeah, and, and is still, you know, and then the fact that we're still so many of us just trying to fight for clean water and for our relatives to be living on lands that is being so uh, desegregated by, by industry. So thank you for sharing that. And it's important that we know those systems in or those systems that affected those disconnections and affected, you know, our own bodies as beings of this land in order to transform it into reconnecting. So this is um, part where I talk about the reconnecting to the spirit of the language. So what we learn, of course, um, from our, our work within our with our elders, our language warriors, our, uh, our, our many mentors, is the importance of reconnecting to the land, right? Of it, just going out and, and using our language within the land, um, you know, our water systems and, and with our children, with our families as much as we can. And you know, practicing that reciprocity. It's one of those laws that we often forget about that when you give, you take and constantly practicing that. And that when we're doing this work, that is really important that it, it is led by our own peoples, our, those peoples of the land in order to uh, acknowledge and, and honor their language and their, their knowledge that they've been sharing. Um, it's like taking grant for those who have like really powerful, you know, gra fierce loving grandmothers or as, 
Kyla and I have been thinking of, of, of those radical aunties and uncles that were trying to come into those roles and that importance of that walk, go to win those, those kinship roles and, and connecting to all of those living beings, not just the human connections, but to the land, the water nation, the sky nation, the land nation. And that we, um, the importance of that being done in community. So I think about, you know, our, 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 rel our relatives, our neighbors, out east who have done a lot of work around rites of passage on the land. And I know in my community, we're doing rites of passage and connecting those elders and, and the younger um, generation in building the walk win those relationships. And the importance of humor. Oh my goodness, we laughed a lot through this. Even through the trauma, reading about the trauma, we had to laugh through that. And that really kind of shook us to keep us grounded. So this is, we'd like to spend a little more time um, in going into the different groups again and talking about the spirit of the language. And again, just reminding those uh, to be, uh, who are don't have that ancestral land connection, language connection, uh, to be active listeners. And uh, I'll let Kyle organize it from here. So if, uh, if the, um, if the host wouldn't mind setting up three separate breakout rooms, uh, in the meantime, uh, I invite people to consider um, again those those different groups. I mean, you can you can break out with uh, you can you can uh, choose or reconsider which group you'd, you'd like to join. Um, but uh, in talking about reconnecting, now having heard about uh, the disconnects, to consider ways you might reconnect to the spirit of the language. So breakout rooms are now open. Oop. Oh, sneak peek! Uh, breakout rooms are now open. You are uh, you're all welcome to to join, and uh, and again try to consider that same protocol of of uh, if you if you if you aren't ancestrally connected to the indigenous language to take an active role in listening, um, and uh, and just uh, ensure that 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 space leaves your mind open and receptive to uh, to some to some learnings. And just thank you for 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 sitting through for the, in this space with us. Um, again, if you're if you're still here, um, go ahead and and hit those ellipses or let us know if uh, if you're having any trouble logging into your preferred breakout room or group. Thank you, Leah, for for opening up those breakout rooms. I didn't mean to pop that surprise at the end. I think I guess that's what happens when you close them. Yeah, it was no problem. They were already ready, so don't worry about it. Whew. We can have a little break. We get to go. I might grab some food down the block. Is that how much time do we have? Oh, we didn't say. Okay. I guess it's our we jurisdiction. We want to give them a bit more time so they can have a little bit more conversation. That's right. Yeah. How are we doing for time? We're, um, once they come back, is, yeah, let's, let's give it like probably 10 minutes from here, maybe. And then that'll put us about halfway through the present, or about an hour through the presentation. So we would have half an hour after that. Um, maybe I should have talked about the, should have opened up the disconnect spot. I don't know. Now we're way ahead. That's great. Rather have yeah. that. Well, it would leave us to have a little bit more discussion at the end of conversation of Q and A or, yeah. With the braiding. Yeah. Yeah. I'll broadcast a message to everybody saying that they have 10 minutes. Is that what you guys decided? At, at 10, at, at uh, the 15 to, to the hour or, or whichever. I'm not hard, sure how to phrase that with international time zones. Okay. <laughs> oh, that disconnect part got me all boiled up inside I, it's so tough i'm just like and this is why my community can't drink water <laughs> <laughs> it's hard not to be so emotionally <laughs> mentally connected to this work so honestly yeah mm -hmm. well, and so my family still struggle with that right what's that ashley Sorry, I was just going to say, just from purely an academic standpoint, what an impressive amount of literature to go through. I can't, I can't imagine that was a very comprehensive view, and you did, you presented it very well. 
despite the subject matter. <laughs> That's the that's the reassurance. All those uh, everyone with uh, 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 what is it? Imposter syndrome in academia needs that reassurance. Thank you. <laughs> I understand. I also think it's important to acknowledge that connection you have, right? Like how important this work is to you. So. Um, I appreciate your passionate, animate um, presentation to Kyle. So, Miasin. Yeah, I, I got to wear a hat or something with a cup of cold water, and at the end, you can put tea in it. It will be all just hot. <laughs> yeah. I'll be right back. And Leah, how, what have been some major uh, key learnings, takeaways, anything that you've got out of uh, this ICLDC? I always like ICLDC because I don't work in um, with languages in the United States or North America, I guess. And so it's always really great to ground in a different conversation um, and be reminded of the different situations that exist throughout the world. And it's always really nice to have that learn those new things that I'm not quite as connected with because I'm elsewhere. Where's your elsewhere? What's your connection? Um, I'm in Indonesia. Yeah, so across the world. <laughs> wow. And, yeah, and which, oh, we just have such different, such different discussions, right? Um, because of different historical experiences and everything. And so it's really nice to so yeah, join a new one. And you see even like some similarities and patterns uh, across the world. Yeah, uh, yeah, other... or some things happening now that happened here long ago, they're starting to happen elsewhere. And so it's great to learn and make those connections. Yeah, so thank you guys for your for your conversation. I'm enjoying it a lot. Yeah, thank you. And Ashley, you making sure making sure we don't we don't uh, trip up too hard. Ashley, if my if my connection disconnects, you got to take it from here, okay? You're good to go. <laughs> oh, are you are you muted? Oh, you're muted. You would think on day three, I would know to unmute my. <laughs> my microphone. No, I was saying, I don't know, I could probably read the slides, but beyond that, uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> just read it with passion. Yeah, you guys just sell it. That's all. <laughs> I was going to say, oh. Leah, good point, I think, especially like working in Hawaii, talking about the difference between, you know, the history of, you know, languages on Turtle Island versus the history of languages elsewhere. Sometimes people who don't work on Turtle Island kind of have this idea of like, oh, colonialism doesn't apply to me. Like these kinds of issues don't apply to me. I don't have to think about it. You know, it's different. So I don't, you know, it's it's interesting to see the, the comparisons of, you know, kind of the difference in time and realizing that the issues do apply. They just, you have to realize in which context um, they apply. Yeah, I mean, like colonialism happened everywhere basically. And I think people forget that too often. Yeah. And in Indonesia, yeah. it's such a different approach. People have different, it, it was a different experience, I guess. So it's a different approach, but yeah, working about talking about language and revitalization and just language maintenance in general is a little tougher and different. Yeah. Maybe not tougher. That's not the right word, but just different. <laughs> I was uh, in Hawaii um, a year ago go in December, so in 2019, December. Mm -hmm. And when I was there, um, it was really interesting coming across because I'm working on a art series on 13 moons, the Cree calendar, and coming across um, a Hawaiian mystic, mystic moon chart calendar. Unfortunately, the ones I got only, oh, you can't see it. It was from 2019 and 2020. But it was incredible because it, it shows like the language 
of, uh, oh no, <laughs> there we go, kind of. Ah, ah. Anyways, and, uh, and then it comes with a book that you can look it up. That's and really cool. And apparently um, the, the uh, elder who did this, oh my goodness, and I apologize. <laughs> I can't say it's Kahu Wendell Kalani Kapuai Nui Silva. Um, it was a little controversial that he was sharing a lot of this, this uh, knowledge, but it's so beautiful. Like just neat if you come across it. Yeah, the way that like it relates to the moons and the different phases of the moon and how they incorporate it in dance and, and you know, growing systems and everything. It's, it's incredibly impressive. And it's part of, um, like that's part of um, the basic curriculum in the language nests, I believe. It's one of the main like, groundings for the studies, at least I think at Punanaleo. Yeah, that's a really cool finding. While you were there. I'm glad you were able to visit Hawaii before all of the COVID restrictions. That's incredible mm -hmm. timing. <laughs> it was, yeah. I was, um, it, is it, it was actually a really powerful spiritual uh, visit there. I had really powerful dreams that um, I'm still incorporating in the work I'm doing now. So it's pretty neat. That's cool. I think uh, we might send out the one minute warning uh, shortly here too. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious, before we get to that, Ashley, um, speaking of, of, of kind of the Hawaiian connection uh, to, to where we are. Um, two years ago, they held the Indigenous Connectivity Summit in Inuvik, Northwest Territories. And so I was up there. And then there was uh, a young uh, Inuvialuit uh, girl, her name is Sidoni Okina. She has, uh, I think, uh, multiple sclerosis. So, and, and, but she, they flew, she flew from, the, she attended one uh, of the Connectivity Conference, and then the next one was held in Hawaii. Uh, talking about um, the digital divide and as it relates to Hawaii, and so I'm just curious, yeah, if you've if you've heard uh, if you've heard of that conference at all, or and, or the connection of connectivity to language before everyone gets back here. I'm really surprised that I haven't heard of that of that conference. That seems like it would be right up my alley. Something I would want to <laughs> find out about, but that's really cool. I haven't, so, I haven't been up to Inuvik. I've always wanted to go. The furthest north I've been is is Northwest Territories. I've been up to Dawson City in Yukon, but haven't made it up to Inuvik yet. Minus 50, I think it was last time I was up there. In Celsius. Yeah. Which does which in Fahrenheit is still pretty close. <laughs> yeah. My husband's family lives in northern Alberta in high level, so it gets pretty cold and stays pretty cold. So I have a little exposure to that, but Edmonton isn't as bad. High level. Wait, are you are you you're calling in from Hawaii though? No, I'm in Edmonton right now. Oh, yeah, I was like, I <laughs> crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my husband's family is from high level, so I've spent some time up there. Well, I'm so glad that you're that uh, you know someone who who is at least closer closer connected to to where we're from as uh, as someone who's helping out. That's so that's so great, Ashley. <laughs> I didn't realize that. I know you're talking about Fort Mac. I'm like, hey, I, I, I know the area. I'll start bringing people back. Is that good? Perfect. Yeah. It'll be another minute, but just want to let you know. I can't believe how fast this is going. <laughs> <It's> like... <laughs> Excellent. So we're slowly starting to see um, some people trickle back. Uh, just while we're waiting for everyone to come back, um, uh, how how did the com maybe some just help help for us uh, before we deliver the next. Um, the next workshop tomorrow. Uh, uh, what, what what kind of might be might be helpful for for you before we open up people to breakout rooms? Would it be helpful if we had like a, some steps on how to join them or or how to get the conversation started?
Welcome back. Welcome back. It's good to see everyone again. Um, okay. Well, uh, actually, uh, maybe, well, well, I think I, I think we're starting to see everyone come back, you know? That's great. Uh, would, uh, would someone from, from group one um, who was talking about the language, like how to reconnect to the spirit of the language through language, um, uh, particularly maybe someone who didn't speak um, uh, before, uh, would you might be interested in, in talking about what your group talked about? Just a very quick rundown. My apologies, I wouldn't know who to nominate. Uh, I didn't jump in the group, I don't know who was there. It's a very quiet group for language group. <laughs> well, linguists, it's a comfortable, well, linguist connected to language. Uh, yeah, um, so a couple people shared and they shared about um, the work that I'm trying to do um, on language acquisition with small children. And I am an Inupiaq person from Nome, Alaska, but my family's from King Island. And we still have very rich traditions in terms of namesakes, naming our babies and children, um, where the spirit of that person that has passed on is onto the child. And so that child is raised. If, if it's a, a leader or somebody who composed a lot of traditional songs and that person, the little child is raised to be that person be like that person. And a um, couple others shared about um, their connections to the land as I look out through my tundra. Um, so, you know, where the language comes from. I had shared earlier that it's really hard to separate language and land because we really believe our language comes from the land. Because so when I went to King Island for the first time as an adult, I saw where it came from for the first time. Words made sense finally. A um, couple others can share real quick, I guess. That wasn't all of it. <laughs> that, that, and that's a really good, uh, uh, that, that is a really good and important sharing, talking about matrilineal connection or, or at least the, the importance of namesakes. And, and transgenerational knowledge uh, sharing. And that's something that we learned too, is the, the importance of, uh, of, uh, of learners, whether they're, whether they're themselves uh, young or, or, um, or just young as learners, right? Regardless of, of age, mm -hmm. but the, the process of learning. Um, right. And, uh, and I, I especially appreciate uh, an Inupiaq and Inuit uh, connection to namesake. Um, right. but, that is a uh, very distinctly uh, different from from my own uh, connection to namesake. So just recognizes. Right, right. So when uh, you talk about disconnection, there what there is that disconnection with our young people, that tradition that you know how you raise your child, and it's very different to raise a child in that language with those beliefs. And with the further disconnect of, of uh, a lot of governments, or, or if, if you try to get like a passport or government ID that they won't recognize uh, Inupiaq names or, or indigenous names. Um, and so reconnecting uh, as a, uh, through namesake is so important. Um, maybe someone from, from group two, I would invite you to, uh, to talk about um, land as reconnecting to the spirit of the language you know having considered uh what had been done to land as as a disconnect and again like like had been raised um it's hard to dis it's hard to separate the three right language land and laws and uh you know it's it's not necessarily like they are separated um but perhaps someone from group two you might be able to talk about land as, as reconnecting to the spirit of the language um, I, I took some notes and I volunteered to kind of be the spokesperson again um, this time because I, I just mostly I just took notes from the other people there um, that shared their you know their their thoughts which were really powerful um, and uh, a lot of what came up was talking about reconnecting was talking about um, part of reconnecting is acknowledging that disconnect. Um, that some of the things we do are using resources that are hurting the land and that there's there's no way around that. Um, and that um, there's things going on in our territories, um, like, and 
and some of us spoke about like even specific things about the bones of our ancestors or about the water about not being our, not having our um our government set out lands connected to water anymore the water that we should be connected to or that they they should be connected to um and that there there's that sort of work that we're doing that even in our, our mental health and our emotional health um, can be tied to land and that going back to our home territory can can um, um, help heal us in that way and that we become more prepared for reconnecting to our language and our laws by being in our territories. Um, and there was a discussion about um, that we're sort of in this place where we're still under institutional um, control or that they, you know, that and that a big part of what we're doing is trying to um, acknowledge those gaps that we have. And then one thing I wrote down, nobody said, but I wrote down was this idea of like land defense and land protection. Like those are um, part of what we have to do. Like it, you know, it's, 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 you know, wanting to learn our language sometimes comes with like, yeah, we need clean water and we need access to our territories and we need to be doing those things too. Um, and then also that we don't, um, we don't always know what we've lost even, just that we, we, we need that, those things and that we want those things. And that's where our hearts are. Someone said, talked about like where our hearts are on our territories, right? Um, and uh, one other thing too, and then, oh, they also, uh, someone mentioned that one, like even one person can be like one drop, like a ripple and that also, and working intertribally. Um, to, to fill some of those gaps, right? We're not necessarily in this alone. Um, and that, and then someone said that resiliency in itself is a way of reconnecting to that um, a lot of those steps are important, you know, um, simultaneously. And I didn't say any names, but I think I got everyone. So. <laughs> and that's so important talking about how, um, how, about resilience and how uh, it's it's like you're you know as Nihil we're we're full parts of these soil right Lana and I in our language, and so you know the land it, it, it's inseparable all of this, and one thing I wanted to recognize um, in, in addendum to what you're saying is that uh, you know from the Hawaiian context is the you know the the land land defense around you know and it's not maybe it's necessarily and not necessarily my role or spot to talk about the appropriate, you know, maybe it's inappropriate for me to talk about this, but, uh, you know, people are aware of the observatory um, the, and the, the um, I think the, the, some astronomers that keep trying to put this observatory in a very spiritual um, spot uh, uh, in Hawaiian lands. And, and you know, again, I, I have never been there. It's not my role to talk about it, but, um, you know, in, in, in that, it's almost like by putting an observatory there, it becomes a disconnect from Hawaiian connection to sky, star, and space, and you know what what Lana and I might refer to as like sky nation, and those that embody that, right? And so, just uh, um, another thing to consider, particularly where, where, for for who's hosting our our role in in sharing our words. Um, so, thank you. That that was really uh, a great and an excellent kind of rundown of what your group had been talking about. Um, and then uh, I'm not sure how many people were in group three um, this time, but any anybody want to talk particularly about um, reconnection to the spirit of the language through laws and 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 laws again very uh, it's up to you how you want to interpret that. Okay, anyone from group three who might be able to to guide us through that. And if not, I um I might just I might just uh, point to, to anyone here. Ah, that's not the two tempting Edwinian Sikas and Sakjoa Sik in Dukchinia, um Treaty Six Territory in Saskatchewan. Hi my friends, I'm from uh, Edwin Thomas from Treaty Six Territory in Saskatchewan, uh, North Belford area. Uh, currently I res uh, I reside in uh, I'm a Scotiawa in uh, in Alberta, in Edmonton, Alberta. Um, the laws uh, in our uh, Nehio Nehio culture are uh, very uh, very important. Um, one of the laws, if not the first and foremost, is um, our Bastahun. Uh, you know, if not second to Wakutuin. Uh, and uh, below that, uh, you know, well, not below it, but um, close to that would be the the, the laws of uh, what I guess we would call karma. 
and um, you know um, whatever you do you know there is always a, a reaction to it you know there is a consequence to whatever you do that is not to the benefit of your fellow people or to the you know to the land that you uh, that you reside from um, I'm finding that a lot of a lot of thinking from our young people now and I guess the colonial way is thinking you know um, the earth needs us now nah, no um, we, we we need the earth, you know, we've, we've gotten, we've strayed from that teaching of, you know, we're part of the earth, we're, we're not the ones that uh, control the earth, if, you know, if we die off, the earth will continue on, you know, it, it might suffer for a little bit, but once the, you know, the human race is no longer here, it, it'll just recuperate and continue on, and whatever life form comes after the human race is whatever the, the earth chooses. Um, and that's one of our teachings in uh, in uh, in uh, from uh, you know, from our Creator, is you know we have to respect what was given to us here in uh, on Mother Earth, and that uh, we 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 do not control. We we are part of that. We we are uh, I guess you would say we're a branch off of uh, what our uh, what our Creator's teachings are, and we we. Um, we help we help to be a part of this ever growing you know uh, race of us of human beings and if we don't respect what we were blessed with well then that can be easily taken away from us and uh, um, I'm still in the learning process of I, I've been I guess I should say I've been blessed to be able to grow up with my language from very from right from you know from home from ever since I could speak I consider uh, uh, Korean as my first language and English as my second you know it, it's always uh, it, and it's for me it's very difficult to just disassociate with just one of these what together because they, they all three you know are are meshed together you know um, e everything is interconnected what uh, that we have our understanding and some of our uh, well uh, Winnie from the Iroquois it, it, it's similar to, you know, what their teachings are. Everything is interconnected. There's a reason for it. And if you, if you, if you decide to, you know, go against those teachings, well, then there's, you know, basta, and there's ochino, and there's, there's consequences. Everything from, you know, picking your plants, your berries, your medicines, you know, taking the water, there's consequences to that. If you, if you have that greed mentality that, um, it, nothing goes without a, a consequence, you know, it's, it, it all has to be done with a good heart, a good mind and, and connect and connection to Mother Earth, um, all with the proper protocol and everything else. Um, a lot of our, you know, I, I'm finding a lot of our youth, they're, they're really wanting to latch on to that. And my, my advice to them is, you know, it's really easy to go talk to somebody, but you don't know that person's intentions um, regarding uh, knowledge and passing on of uh, whatever our laws in our languages. Um, so I always say, you know, build a good relationship to whoever you are seeking with, you know, get to know them, get to know who they are, where they came from, what they were, you know, blessed with, what they were given, um, what they what they earned in regards to our, our Nehio way of uh, uh, teachings and culture. Um, it's just, uh, it's, it's really sad that um, many of our knowledge keepers and they do, they do have a lot of knowledge, but they've gone astray and used it for wrong purposes, which is, you know, um, money. And, and that, that's not right. That's, that's, um, it's not correct. It's not our way. Um, you know, we, um, we do have to give for whatever we receive, but it has to be connected with the way creator um, asked of, you know, our ancestors to, to do so. And that is with protocol or whatever it may be. You know, um, I always say, you know, to tell the youth, you visit an elder, visit a, a knowledge keeper. There's anything you can do for whatever they give you. You can, you know, tidy up their home. Um, if, if they have a vehicle, pour gas for them. Um, cleaner cleaner yard or pick berries for them pick sweet grass for them anything anything can be done you know other than the exchange of always money um it's we do live in an age yes i agree that we do need money but that our our culture and our teaching should not be 
the forefront of of receiving money. No, um, there's other ways. There's others. There's other um, things that can be done to uh, to acquire our, our knowledge. Um, so it's we our laws are very important in the in the heel in the heel in the heel culture in the heel way of living in the heel um and we we need to retain that and go back to uh following those laws and because yeah like like an elder once told me before you you can't you can't hold a pipe while you're you know while you're speaking english you cannot pray for your people while holding a pipe and you're speaking English, you must speak your language because our, our language is medicine, our language is spirit, and that spirit reaches where it needs to go with whatever prayers we are carrying with that that pipe. That is all for now. Hi, hi. I really appreciate your words. Um, thank you. And it sounds so good to hear uh, our language in, in this presentation. So that really is especially impactful. Um, Lana, I've talked enough. Maybe uh, if you want to walk us through the rest of this presentation here, I think we have formally 12 minutes left, but uh, however you want to choose to spend it is up to you. Thank you. Um, maybe if we just kind of advance the slides and I'll just pull out a few um, important points to uh, reflect on and then we can um, spend the next 10 minutes, close with 10 minutes of Q&A or discussions um, from what we've heard. So again, thank you everybody for uh, sharing your reflections on this work. Um, so as kind of when we went through uh, a lot of this, this, this work, which is so close to our hearts because it's our work is part of our lives as, as Indigenous uh, researchers and scholars and community members, and especially as relatives. Um, and thank you, Edwin, for mentioning, you know, uh, Nehio Bamatsu and living that good life, we have to constantly walk. And for those who are still learning our languages, you know, one of the things of this language reclamation is definitely to reconnect to that, um, to the land and to those laws and through ceremony within our, our, our spiritual families for many of us because of the disconnection to our, our family systems, right? And so um, we were very... Uh, we were reminded many times about even the importance of institutions keeping, um, letting community hold the our that our language belong to our future generations, especially when a Canadian government here is creating laws to, you know, our language laws um, of Indigenous languages and so the concern for just now our grandmothers and many my relations too of like okay enough with trying to uh control our languages now you the land has been taken you know that our our disconnection to all of those relatives you know our our grandfathers our ancestors our grandmothers all of that so you know, leave our languages alone, that languages need to be within our families and have autonomy and sovereignty uh, within our communities and families. The next one. Um, and so uh, that the, the importance of, um, you know, learning as we shared, you know, the importance of that community owned uh, driven, governed um, languages. As mentioned, I went to Blue Quills, a former Indian residential school, where one of the policies was that children were not allowed to speak their only language they knew, which in, in, in my territory was Nehiawewin. And then as a child of an Indian residential school, um, survivor, thriver, <laughs> is that we you know, we, we've, we've learned this kind of hybrid of English of thinking in Cree, as, as I shared with um, my elders, you know, that because you don't speak the language does not mean you're not of this earth. You are inherently connected to that language because of that blood memory and the importance of, of, of acknowledging that. And so I know one of the questions that was asked with some of this work is, is there a way we can bring in these, these, this idea of the spirit of the language within even our English language, because so many of our young people 
um, are disconnected. And the good thing about a lot of this work, though, like at Blue Quills is one of the only reserve, it's the only reserve in Canada that's specifically for education, is that they created their own degree programs from uh, bachelor's to master's in Indigenous language and uh, led by language speakers and elders. And, um, but that there is an increase of, of um, registers every single year. So the hunger for language is there. And, and that, and like, as mentioned earlier, the also kind of working with our, our land protection and our protection for family and for women, because we're now part of our prophecies here is that we are in a time, we've turned into the time of the woman and that's again, connected to the cosmo cosmology view. So I uh, kind of gave a lot in such a short period of time, but I wanted to um, open this time for any questions or comments. Hi, hi. Yeah, just, uh, just while we open this up here, um, like, like, like Edwin had, had, had raised is that, and, and like a few people had raised actually, is that, you know, these things are inseparable, right? Land, language, and, and the laws which govern them, right? Um, and so just in, in um, Lana had phrased it to me to, to weave those braids together, to weave those strands together, because that's, that's what we'll need to, to make this whole. So um, we'd just kind of like to close the, um, close our workshop here with a, with a more of an, an open discussion um, around, uh, you know, first we talked about a kind of a history and some context there as it relates to our language. And we talked about the role of harms and, and, and the reconnect would be the role of healing. Um, if there are any key takeaways or anything you'd like to discuss, um, yeah, feel free. So there are two questions in the chat. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. So the first one says, I'm co facilitating the adult Cree conversation group with Andrea Custer. Could you share your PowerPoint? Um, all of these, um, this workshop is being recorded and it will be shared on Scholar Space eventually. But um, if you wanted to speak to that, otherwise there are other questions as well in the chat. Lana, what's your... Your thoughts on that? Well, Andrea shared with us, so <laughs> I, I'm I'm good with um yeah, maybe if you can contact Kyle for the PowerPoint, uh we'd be happy to share it back as well. Sure, that was my question. <laughs> yeah. And all of so. all of what you shared is just you know what the elder Matilda was actually uh participating with us the first eight weeks. And so she was our elder for our adult free sessions that we have on Sunday mornings at 8 a.m. Like we have absolutely nothing else to do on Sunday morning, but um, she's been our, our elder for the last eight weeks. And I don't think she's going to be with us for the next eight weeks, which starts tomorrow morning. But all of what you've said and what Edwin has shared and then others have shared are just an affirmation that we're on the right track and uh, that we're doing the right thing. So didn't ask for that. I'm in a, um, amazing yeah uh, and so I dropped my my email there in the chat uh, knapier at ualberta.ca um, feel free copy and paste it get a hold of the organizers they know how to bug us too we're not hard to reach <laughs> we're communicators <laughs> so it, it shouldn't be difficult um, and so that was one question and then uh, and then you, you said that there was another question sorry it's difficult to navigate these windows Sure, there is another question in the chat from Justin and it looks like it's for Lana. It says, how can one learn more of indigenous cosmology? So it's always uh, a very good question. Um, even as a language learner, uh, what my uncle Jerry Saddleback um, is one of the few elders who know the long story of our creation story. So that's one of the first places is starting with the creation stories. Cause as I'm again, like learning the language, especially that high Cree is um, there's so, it, it, every, every question you have um, around
found that cosmology, land connection, those laws is in the creation story. And so for, for Nehyeo, uh, when, when our, the Cree language creation story, that it takes four months. So there's four vi- different versions, four straight months from sunrise to sunset to hear that full, um, which we did in the winter, of course. And then there's the four day one, which my uncle calls a tsa tsa um, where you just get a very brief, brief, brief introduction. So starting with the creation stories, looking at those, those, those stories are bit, is an important first place to learn about that cosmology. Excellent question, uh, Justin. And I'm, I'm just reading through the chat. There's some really, really great conversations going on. Um, so I'm really, and thank you, Percy, for also letting me know the extent of the telescope that's attached to the observatory, or that would be right at 30 meters. That's ridiculous. <laughs> I, I'm I'm two meters. Uh, I can't imagine uh, I can't imagine the damage that a 30 meter telescope would cause. Yeah. But, yeah, as someone who's very invested in astronomy, but also very invested in um, indigenous rights, uh, you know, it's definitely. It's definitely an issue that I've kind of been following. I know that there have been some famous names. I think Jason Momoa, who have joined the protests and stuff. Um, but, and, and you know, it's, it's a really complicated issue in part because there aren't a lot of good places to put a telescope of that size. But also, like, it's not okay to desecrate land, so... That's a really important discussion. And, and just uh, maybe while we close here, um, we just see, uh, I see a note uh, that we'll, we'll close the conversation automatically soon. Um, I, yeah, actually we have one more question here from Charlie uh, and, and, and Lana, if, if it's okay, I might ask, ask it of you. So Charlie asks, what advice do you might have for learners whose motivations are low for the language? Um, I kind of interpret that question as, well, in a sense, like if it's low for light, like um, uh, if you're have this kind of low motivation of within the language is that you won't get it. You won't get that connect to the spirit of the language. I I may be misunderstanding the question, um, but yeah. I, I don't quite understand it. <laughs> and, and often, I, I guess, to consider the, the roles of what might make for motivation to be low in, in language learning. And that would often be, right, if you're ancestrally connected to the language, it, it might be um, social harms or traumas um, or you know, institutions, or, or um, the, which are not supportive of language learning. And so um, just to respond, if you're, if you're feeling um, uh, if your motivation is low in learning a language that you're ancestrally connected to, to try to um, realize that, that that is a result of, of trauma um, being effective in, in, her, in harming and hurting. And so that would be your motivation is to counteract that trauma through healing um, and to ensure that that language is available for your, not only your next generation, but perhaps you know, five generations from then. Beautiful. Beautiful answer. <laughs> Thank you. And then uh, just what, before everyone automatically gets kicked out, I'm just maybe going to ramble here in these last two minutes, talk about um, cosmology and ancestral connections to scar- stars in space. Is that my role as a Dene Tedlene, uh, like a, an ancestral Dene from the region, is that um, we're actually descendant of, um, of the... Um, of, of Denende, who was hunting across the, the skies and the stars. Um, and so as the giant was hunting in the stars, he was shooting his arrow and he was hunting and then he tripped and fell. And he made, now this is outside of Nehio epistemology and cosmology. It's, it's another language I'm connected to. But then the giant fell, he made this massive land area and it takes up what's colonially referred to as Alaska, and uh, Yukon, Northwest Territories, parts of what's uh, Nunavut, uh, Saskatchewan, Alberta, all this massive giant that fell. And so whenever I'm thinking about the stars and the skies, it's like Lana said, to think about creation. Well, that's the reason, that's one of the major reasons for that land area is this giant that had fell. So 
um, to think about that connection to sky and, and space is like, you know, some people refer to ourselves as star people, you know, um, uh, and depends on the language that you're connected to. But, but you know, it's, it's not, it doesn't disagree with um, what actually a lot of astrophysicists or whoever might say is like, you know, we are all born from stardust or whichever from however many millions of years ago. That agrees with with our with our logic and our our cosmologies and our understandings of skies and space, um, and so like in recognizing that congruence, um, you know both both with with that you know uh, cosmology and and then also you know probably the most contentious part of our presentation is the duality of belief systems um, between right and uh, nehyo uh, ancestral connection to. Um, uh, oh, well, natural belief systems and epistemologies and understanding. And then, um, you know, some people that we spoke to hold that belief system in congruence with, um, they, they are Christians themselves, proud Christians. And so, um, you know, in that way, our role is, is, is um, not to designate uh, or validate or invalidate any belief system, but more to recognize uh, the congruence of them. Um, and uh, you know, recognizing sure institutional harms, but but not necessarily the belief system or worldview. So, in that same way of relating to scars and space with cosmologies, um, here, that's just a ramble. I like to fill time. <laughs> we are seeing um, some more words, and then Lana just dropped the website spiritoflanguage.ca. Um, we haven't officially we haven't officially released it. So this is a pre-release. Um, but uh, the eventual invitation is to, to get people to share their um, stories and their words around um, spirit, uh, spirit of the language as it relates to the languages that they're connected to. Um, but great reminder, Lana, to make sure that we share that. <laughs> and then thank you so much. Uh, and, and, and Percy, thank you for also uh, contributing more around, around that conversation. Um, okay, fantastic. I guess uh, I guess everyone's gonna get kicked out here technically at 2.20. So Xemaga, Mr. Kananasko Mwao. Um and Lana, if I, if uh, if you don't mind, close me. Hi hi, Mr. Here. Um then kakiano newagamaganak. I thank you all oh, with all my heart, all my relations. Hi hi. I'm wishing you the best in the rest of your time with ICLDC. Yes. Mm -hmm. Go Thank you. Kistamuna Tenega Chan. Gelakasla. That was very informative. Uh, thanks for answering my question about cosmology.